Good evening. Welcome everyone to Life with God, episode 12. This is the last episode of our season where we have been studying the love of God for six weeks, uh, two episodes every week. And we have been extremely blessed, extremely enriched by the conversations that we have had with the students, with the expert guests that have joined us from different um, perspectives, offering us different understandings, different facets of um, understanding the different facets of the love of God and of the concept of love. We cannot end this season without studying a specific context that is extremely important and complex and uh, sometimes difficult. And that is the concept of uh, the context of leadership. And so for tonight's discussion, which will be on love in leadership, we have invited Dr. Efrain Velasquez, who is president of the Inter-American Adventist Theological Seminary. And so Efrain, bienvenido, welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us. Thank you, thank you, and blessings to all of you. Also, we have as part of the discussion, Keegan. Welcome back, Keegan. We have Zoe, welcome Zoe. And Ashley, welcome back, Ashley. Sorry. Um, as usual, we will take a few minutes to get to know our guest for ourselves and for the viewers. And so we hope to discover as many interesting things as, as possible. Where did you grow up? Puerto Rico. What was your favorite class in college and why? My favorite class in college was uh, the class on Old Testament and also uh, the class on homiletics. And because I enjoy stories and to tell stories, I'm a storyteller from the countryside. So. Awesome. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Extrovert. <laughs> awesome. Did you ever have a stuffed animal? And if so, what was its name? It was Popeye. It was, uh, it was an animal, but it was the, the one that uh, was with me until I was a teen. <laughs> what are some of your uh, cherished spiritual practices? Um, I think it will be um, contemplation. Uh, I think that that's a practice that I enjoy uh, to meditate. Mm. When you were a kid, what was your dream job? To be a medical doctor in the Amazons. Uh, I'll be in, in a boat and that's what I was looking forward. But then I realized that, uh, uh, an OBG because I wanted to, to have children, you know, to see them come, you know, then I, realized all that was involved and I said yeah maybe not and that's too much time in school. <laughs> Do you prefer reading or listening to audiobooks? Reading and marking and writing and everything. <laughs> what is the funniest thing you've ever seen an animal do? Uh, the funniest thing uh, at least I think it was funny when they, uh, a ram would just ram my cousin and <laughs> got him to his knees. That was funny. What are um, some, maybe the top three countries that you have visited and you have enjoyed in a special way? Uh, the top three countries that I have enjoyed, uh, there's so many that I have enjoyed, but uh, I would say Jordan, um, also uh, Israel, Palestine. Uh, I think those will be my three countries. What can you describe a time for us where it was really clear that God was working in your life? Uh, when I, when I was really young, uh, I remember I was six going uh, to a, the house of a really grumpy man that has had kicked out everybody that will visit him. And, and he will accept me and, and I will just go every Sabbath. And, and, and I used to walk uh, my, in my neighborhood, you know, my mom will allow me to go and, and, and to see uh, the faces of people and old, especially the old people receiving me and letting me share the word. I think that was a very special time. Hmm. What is one word you would use to describe your job? 
exciting. What has been your most valuable failure? Uh, there's so many failures, so many, so many. And they have been all been uh, very valuable. Uh, I think once uh, <laughs> I was at Andrews and I, um, I had applied for a scholarship from the Hispanic Theological Initiative. And I went to the interview and it was expected I would write on, on a Latino topic, uh, something that it's uh, in theology and, and so on. But I was just speaking about archeology span and the Bible. So uh, they grilled me <laughs> at the interview. I had a really, really tough experience there uh, because the mentality then was different from, from now. Now they are really open to other areas. But uh, it was a very uh, humiliating experience and, 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 and it was a failure. But then I applied again and then I, I was blessed with the most wonderful family of non-Adventists that I have ever been. And it has been a wonderful journey uh, of more almost 25 years uh, with the family of HDI. So thank you at Princeton University and all these people that I love all over the world right now. What are some of the favorite things uh, to do with your family? Uh, kayaking and actually uh, the devotional. We love it. Wow. Every night in the morning, seven, 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 you know, it's always there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Efrain. Thanks to everyone else too. Um, this was uh, nice. It was nice to get to know a few things about you and your background. Um, you are an Old Testament scholar and an, an archaeologist, right? That is part of your expertise. Um, my career is in ruins, you know. Um, pardon me? I, my career is in ruins, you know. Oh. I'm in ruins. <laughs> Yes, well, we can learn a lot about uh, a lot of things. We can learn about a lot of things from ruins. Uh, and uh, tonight, maybe we can learn something about love from that experience, uh, from the different types of experiences you have had in different uh, roles, in different um, segments of your life. Um, leadership and love. God is our leader. Um, and we are called to be in leadership positions throughout life in so many different ways, in so many different capacities and places. And um, that is a high responsibility, but it's also a place of uh, vulnerability uh, because we're humans. And so we fail more, more times than we succeed, probably. And um, love does play a big role in leadership. Uh, I, I'm not going to say much more. I would, I would uh, wait for our guests to um, help us go into the topic. Uh, watching along as we stream live, uh, you are welcome to comment on Facebook under this link to the live stream. And you're also welcome to comment as usual on YouTube in the chat box. And so we would love to make room for you in this discussion. Efrain, um, love is something we struggle with in our personal lives, but also as leaders, uh, also as church members, also as Christians. And um, the love of God, the concept of God as love is not uh, exempt from this struggle. Um, and so, Help us, help us get into the discussion here with, with, this, with this concept. Is it okay? Is it okay to struggle? And how do we cope with it as Christians, as leaders? Uh, what are some of the directions that help us, give us some insight in, into how to, how to navigate this, um, this aspect? I grew up uh, in, a, in the Latino context. And usually... Uh, in this context, we have the idea that, that leaders are highly respected, that they, they have it all together, they shouldn't be criticized, uh, they should not um, uh, open up the vulnerabilities, um, they have to present this uh, persona that in inspires others uh, to do likewise. So. Uh, that's why I was very scared of becoming a leader at any point and, and uh, to be in that platform. 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's something that I think different cultures resonate with. You shared about your own. I can, sh I can say the same thing about my own. Uh, and probably, if not an entire culture, definitely pockets within cultures will, will struggle with that concept of um, this high expectation of a leader being almost non-human, I guess, if, if you want to say it. Um, so how do you, um, what are some of the experiences you've had with God, uh, with maybe some Bible passages that helped you um, navigate this, um, this challenge? How have you, how have you changed as you, as you try to, to figure out what kind of leader you should be or you, or God calls you to be? Well, um, there, there's a book that has haunted me for years and, and I have enjoyed perhaps too much the harsh answers that the audience will reply back to God. Uh, and it's the book of Malachi. Uh, it's the conversation between Bart Simpson and Homer. Uh, they are, the Lord says, I love you. And say, they say, talk to the hand, you know, how have you loved us? And that resonates with me. And, and that book uh, has been in that, this journey of, of struggling with uh, failure as they feed. Mm. Wow. As a, as a leader, like I often like have this viewpoint that it's super hard to like live up to other people's standards, right? You mentioned what you mentioned within your Latino context that you have to have the perfect persona in order for the people to continue to respect you and kind of look up to you. But oftentimes even doing what we think as a leader, right, is what the people want often they don't respond to in the best positive way. So as a leader, how do we take that negative feedback that sometimes the people that we're leading give us? And how do we instead use that maybe to challenge us, but also to further like reach out to others perhaps? Uh, I, I have read uh, since I was uh, a teenager, I was interested in, in ministry related, you know, uh, magazines and so on, um, and, and, and leadership literature. And, and I see that uh, many of the models that we had were the great people, these biographies, these great men or women that had, had all these struggles and how they have succeed. So, so when criticism comes, uh, most of the times we're defensive. Uh, mm -hmm. I will be defensive. I will, I will feel attacked uh, and I will respond uh, in a negative way many times and still today. Uh, so I, I guess I, uh, the, 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 the paradigm that I want to live up to and I share with others is about a vulnerable leadership. So I don't have the idea of this, even the servant leadership that many times we just use that to manipulate other people. It's ideal in the paper, but... Uh, but I, I think that vulnerable leadership will appreciate that criticism and, and that uh, will be open uh, to be held accountable. I'm intrigued. Oh, go ahead, Ewan. I was just going to comment. Is that something that as leaders we should start implementing immediately as soon as like we're given some kind of leadership position? Or is that something that really takes a while to really adhere and, and learn how to show i think that uh, it's a it's a personal journey uh everybody will feel differently uh, how and when they will open up like that uh, i have a problem of having very few filters and and i'm very poor diplomacy so i when i fail i will just tell it you know i, I i'm not scared or concerned about saying that uh this is true, you know, I really mess up. Uh, and, I, and, and, and many times that will make some people in some context to make sure that others will push you and will throw you aside and will black label you or whatever. But at other contexts, uh, perhaps even if you suffered through that at some point, when they see the value that you have, uh, then that will be a blessing. 
and at least that has been with me, that instead of trying to, to uh, beef up my resume or, or uh, make up stories, make them greater uh, on the country, when I put them down and then I have friends correcting the story and telling them as they were that were perhaps bigger than I'm trying to tell them, that really can, gets more respect of people. Hmm. Can you give us a portrait of this vulnerable leader? Because I'm really curious, what does that look like? Uh, maybe a few features. Uh, the vulnerable leader, we understand that um, he doesn't have to prove anything. He doesn't have to, to impress uh, the people around them. Uh, the vulnerable leader will not be, be shy to uh, uh, show up the, the negative part that uh, that he has or she has, uh, and and I will try to um, to encourage others, even though he's failing in that regard. We'll try to encourage others uh, on on not failing like I am failing, uh, and telling them that they can do better. So uh, it's not Christ-like because Christ Christ was not failing. Uh, so it will be. Uh, Paul-like, perhaps, and that's why the book of Philippians is really, uh, for me, the paradigm of leadership, and he will uh, be uh, honest about uh, not being perfect and about just forgetting what is behind and moving forward. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, earlier a difference between a vulnerable leader and the term that gets thrown around a lot being a servant leader and which is sometimes used to manipulate um, people. Can you explain a little more, like elaborate on the difference that you see between those? I think that the ideal will be to be a servant leader. I appreciate people who have written about servant leadership and about the ideal of servant leadership. And the concept is not wrong. It's the practice of it, which has being wrong and I have uh, used it in my mouth but then I have seen that I am not really being a servant I am I was manipulating I was not doing things as as a servant is supposed to do so uh, being a vulnerable leader will just acknowledge that and, and will acknowledge that I was not really trying to to serve others uh, and and the essence of leadership it's that selfless love and as i said before in philippians 2 you have this hymn in greek it's a hymn uh, in chapter 2 about how we have to uh, consider others uh, greater than ourselves and empty ourselves that's that's leadership i think that's the ideal of uh, then then we're going to become servants so you'll be vulner vulnerable in order to become a real servant leader. Mm. You know, I, I see what you're saying, but I have to think that even within that concept of, of servant leadership, there has to be something deeper because I, I, I watch movies and TV shows and, and I try to stay a little up to date and you see a lot of like these servant leaders and movies today of like these superheroes or whatnot that are helping people and you know they're saving the world and whatnot but I don't know for me it feels really shallow so in in terms of like you know they're helping people but it almost seems as though they're doing it kind of for like personal gain so in view of that how how does this kind of servant leadership differ from maybe servant leadership that we see portrayed and pop culture, honestly. Uh, and I think it, it will be in the value of, of being honest about our own selfish interests, even though we are serving others. Uh, at the end of the day, we have a quid to pro relationship uh, many times that we expect. Uh, and this is the, the, the big difference. Uh, we, expect, we, we expect reciprocity. And that's where you see if you're really being a servant leader or you were being a manipulator. If you expect, if you're keeping scores, if you feel offended because you were not 
honored or you were not treated uh, after all the sacrifice, you were not treated properly, that's when you realize that you were not being a servant leader. So two things. First, acknowledge that even in the most lofty things that you do for others, you're still selfish and you still have to have yourself on check on that. And second, uh, not to keep scores, just do things and forget about the good and about the bad. Mm -hmm. Wow. I would actually push back a little bit on that. It's like, as Christians, we believe that God is selflessness incarnate. So if Christ is dwelling within us, I do not believe that selfishness rules the way we lead. I believe that Christ within us rules the way we lead. So it's like, will we get something to gain? Yes. <laughs> there are very little things in the world that we don't gain something if we do it. But the idea is like, we are doing this out of selfishness. Like, if I believe that Christ, infinite love, infinite compassion, infinite giving is dwelling within me and working to make me, working to make me like the Father and like Him and like the Holy Spirit. It's like the idea of I'm doing this for my own game and some little nugget in my mind. It's like I don't think that that's what Christ-like leadership was. It's like was Christ benefited from dying on the cross? Of course. Okay, not like not like the actual like pain and like torture part. But it's like he was benefited because he was able to spend eternity with people that he loved that wouldn't have been able to have that chance before. I I, I will I will disagree on that because I think mm -hmm. that Jesus did not gain anything and 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 that's why I said uh, that's why I cannot have a Christ like servant leadership and I will say perhaps Paul like or whatever like but mm -hmm. I, I there's always this thing uh, of of selfishness there perhaps I'm not. Uh, seeing it immediately, and I don't, I don't plan it before. Oh, whoa, I have this sinful purpose behind. No, no. But at the end of today, uh, there's, there's. I am a sinner, you know, and I see sin as a condition that uh, we are in that process, and that's why. Let's look at Philippians. Don't listen to me. Philippians chapter three. Paul, mm -hmm. Paul says in verse twelve, "I am not perfect." Then in verse 13, he says, forgetting what is uh, behind, I move forward. And then in verse 15, he says, I am perfect. So then, then you're right, because the blood of Jesus will make me perfect before him and before God. And in that sense, we can be perfect, which is uh, mature, what we have the Greek word there. <laughs> and, and in, but it's not because of me. It's because of what he has uh, placed his justice on me. I agree. Like, I definitely agree is like Christ's justice covers all things. It's like, but just as in Philippians, he in Romans 8 says, it's like those with the flesh on their minds live according to the flesh. They live according to their selfishness, but those who have the spirit on their minds live according to the spirit. There is no selfishness in the spirit. It's like, while like while we may do things that are selfish and that are self-gaining, it's like Satan's temptation of Christ to be selfish was just a temptation. Satan's temptation of us is like, you are doing God's will, but you're doing it selfishly. It's like, no, Christ within us is working selflessness in order that we might be selfless with other people. Could that be interpreted as selfish? Maybe. But, but, but you're saying something really important, and I love it. You know, in Romans chapter 7, you have this, this law, mm -hmm. and it's the law of the flesh, mm -hmm. which is doing, you know, making me what I don't want to do and what I don't want to do, then I do. Then in chapter 8, verse 3, it states, states what was impossible for the law, Many people interpret that as the Decalogue, as the Ten Commandments. But no, what was impossible for the law of the flesh, that, that selfish love, and then speaks about the law of the spirit, which are, you're pointing out. And that's what, what uh, I guess, leadership, true leadership 
will, uh, will gear toward to have that law of the spirit rule. And that's why we go back to the book of Philippians. In book, the book of Philippians, we can do all things in Christ, 4.13. In 3.13, we forget what's behind, but the source is 2.13. 2.13 says that he will do the do and the, the will and the do. And the Greek word is energizo, to energize. He's the one who, who does. So it's not mine. It's that law. And then to finish up Philippians, then we have the promise in 1.6 that the one who began the good work will be able to finish it. I think that's so beautiful, especially how you say that God gives us both the ability to do something and the will to do something. Because I know, especially as leaders, it's like that standard that Keegan was talking about, that like really weighing down the expectations of everyone. It's like it can cause a lot of people to not want to be leaders, even though God has said, it's like you have this capability to lead your community. It's like, Lord, I don't want 50, 100, 1,000 eyes on me waiting for me to fail. But the beautiful thing is like God gives us that will and God gives us that ability in order for us to do his purpose and his love and express his spirit through us and show the fruits towards everyone, which I just think is absolutely beautiful. If I can reflect um, on what I'm hearing from you, Ephraim, and let me know if I'm understanding it correctly or not, but what I'm hearing you say is that there is a component of honesty and of vulnerability in servant leadership that deepens that concept that enables us to have to seek and to appreciate mutual accountability to be you know to see ourselves uh, not as you know people in the ivory tower that are not not reachable um, but human beings with imperfections and i'm guessing if we see ourselves as that if we portray ourselves as that we will also be a little more relatable to others um i'm thinking of jesus that as a leader jesus um he became vulnerable and he was our leader in a very vulnerable state as a, he became one of us basically and that's <laughs> that right there is the ultimate vulnerability for god right um and so that's how he served us by being one of us uh, identify himself with our shortcomings even though he did not have himself shortcomings but he identified himself himself with our life and so um i i, I love it personally because um, I think it's freeing for the leaders to see themselves in that posture. Um, and I think it also helps more something that I call shared leadership uh, and something that I appreciate a lot where uh, depending on different, just because you're in a certain position, it doesn't mean that you have the final word. And that allows, you know, this, um, this vulnerable kind of leadership also allows other people to enter the conversation and to be part of a part of the leadership, right? So I don't know, that's at least how I perceive that uh, hearing you. Indeed, um, indeed. And, and let me just add that, that uh, uh, Philippians 2 uh, mentions that obedience of Jesus and uh, uh, obedient unto the point of death and death of cross. And it's, it's about emptying, he, he, the concept of kenosis. He emptied himself. And some people have spoken about kenotic leadership, you know, you empty yourself, in order to let God uh, work through you. And if, if we allow that, then we stop being the victims. Oh, people are being so mean to me. I am oppressed. I am this. I am that. All the situations that we're always uh, the victim of, of everybody and everything, uh, we, we stop that because we realize that we have to empty ourselves and then allow God to do the work in us and through us. And then we lead because Jesus did not call leaders. He called followers. And then those followers who follow Jesus, then we'll have other people following them too, to Jesus. So there's a passage that you mentioned earlier in the conversation that I would love to go back to. Malachi. I don't even remember anything about this book right now, to be honest. It's, it's not one of the books we read often. It doesn't come very, you know, it doesn't cycle very often in our, on our reading list. And so um, you, you mentioned a few things about leaders struggling to understand um, God's love. I'm also currently reading um, the story of Israel. And just when they, they, they went in Deuteronomy 1, 
when Israel was again at the border of Canaan. Um, and so Moses reminds them of their history. And he, he, he says, uh, when you were here 40 years before, well, it was a different generation, I guess, but um, you, you understood God to hate you. Like the expression is, you thought God hates you. Even when God was lovingly trying to get them to the promised land, they misinterpreted that love for hate, which is fascinating to me. And so I wonder what's happening in Malachi. Why, why are people struggling with God's love? And what do we as leaders do with that struggle? Is, is that something that resonates with you in your personal life? You know, can you share with us anything from the text, but also maybe from your experience about struggling to understand um, the love of God? But the book of Malachi uses both words, love and hate. I love Ahab, Jacob, and I hate it, Sane, Esau. And, okay. and, and that makes wonder, or hate. Uh, and, and, and the people of, of, of the book of Malachi, uh, they were uh, assuming that God was hating them. And with good reason. Because the people from Malachi... This is the generation after the exile. This is the generation that, that had heard about the, um, uh, the, the, the promises of the Messiah. This is uh, the year 485, approximately. And the temple has been built. You had the people from Haggai. Uh, and if you, you, if you use uh, generations, the people of Haggai will be the modern, modernist people. Uh, the BB boomers and the builders of the past generations. So they said, uh, in, 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 let's build a temple and the Messiah will come, the shaking of the nations. But then nothing happens. In the book of Malachi, we don't see the Messiah. This is a colony that is under an empire. They are broke and they have corrupt governors. This is not Puerto Rico. Any, any kind of reflection of the colony and that, 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 it's just pure coincidence. But they are, they are bickering against God. And you have six articles. They're back and forth. I'm your father. You claim that uh, you're my children. How, how are we not, we not are honoring you? And then they, they bring all these uh, nasty uh, sacrifices. And then they ask after all these tragedies in their lives. This is uh, what we would call a protest theology. Um, and the concept of protest theology is a post-Holocaust theology uh, that, that claims that, that God is an anti theodicy if you will, that God is guilty because he failed. God mm -hmm. failed in the Holocaust. The cost is too high. Why so many lives if you could stop it? And then after the Holocaust, uh, of uh, the, the Jewish Holocaust, then you had Cambodia, and then we had uh, Rwanda, and then we had uh, Congo, and, and uh, we had Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have seen the Yazidis. Uh, we have seen the death marches of so many. And then when you sum, up, sum that up with things that have happened in our own lives, then I resonate with the protest that these people had and how they were angry. They were angry because they feel that God had failed them. But, but the fact that Malachi, Malachi is vulnerable enough to allow these voices of, of protest mm. to be heard and that we can interact with them today. I am more comfortable reading my Bible because I have Malachi, and not just sounds of praise and nice stories with happy endings. Mm -hmm. You're so, so right. It's like, I remember going through a very difficult time in my life and being angry with God. It's like, like I said in an earlier episode that my mom died of cancer. Like I remember when she first got diagnosed, I was just like staring out into the night and being like, God, why me? It's like, why my mom? It was like, there are those people that bully me at school. Why not their parents? It was like, there are those people over there that is like, just like the people in prison. Why not their parents? And it's like, 
God does not, God does not condemn human emotion. And I think that's something that's extremely important for me to realize as a Christian and as a leader, because as a Christian is like, there is very much this culture of, oh, Christianity is nice and it is kind. And it's like, it's there for you when you're sad. And that's basically it. It's like, but God is not only a God of kindness and faithfulness and love, but he's also a God of taking care of the oppressed and standing up for the widow and the orphan. And as a leader, it's like, I have to recognize that when one of my followers or one of my fellow leaders does something or experiences something that calls for justice, I can't just sit back and say, it's like, that's not the appropriate response you should have. You have to be kind. You have to be nice. It's like, just sweep it under the rug and don't worry about it. It's like, God looks at us and I am not sure what Psalm it is, but God looks at us and he counts every tear and holds it in a bottle. So I read a beautiful quote in Desire of Ages and it basically sums up to, I was there and I know your every pain, the pain that you can never tell another person, the pain that is so hard that you literally stay up at night because you cannot imagine feeling any way else. And it's as a leader, God comforts and God provides justice and God loves through those things. And as a leader myself, I have gone through tough situations where it was like, it was easier to be quiet. It was so much easier being quiet. But would I allow my friend to experience abuse? Would I allow my church member to continue to continue doing things to like, not like molestation or something like that, but continue spewing hateful comments to their nephew or their cousin or their fellow sister in Christ? It's like being a leader is not easy. Being a Christian is not easy, but God, did this for us. God stood up for us when I am sure it would have been easier to do absolutely nothing. Just say it's like, forget that. That was a mistake. We don't need to look at that. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you mentioned something very important about the concept of justice and you mentioned it uh, several times. And, and it's a word that uh, is used in different contexts today. Uh, with different last names after the word justice. And, and I, I wonder how, how much of that is, is biblical justice. Uh, the concept of biblical justice is quite different from the concepts that we have of justice today. And when I spoke about Protest the theodicy, uh, uh, they have their own definition of justice uh, and love. Uh, that's why I, I could not stay there in that dark place. And I'm glad for John Peckman and his concept of a theodicy with the, the cosmic content and love uh, in, in, in the way that he uh, picks me up from that uh, hole. And, and then uh, I see that our, our answers perhaps are not to be judged as, as correct or incorrect. The uh, vulnerable leadership just tells you what they have done is descriptive, not prescriptive. Uh, and, and I don't want to use the expression of picking up your battles because that could be very lame and that could be very self-serving. But you will see in, in, even in scripture that there's not a consistent way of doing things under the will of God. And many times uh, the, 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 the justice that we think it's, it's fair and it's just it's, it's selfish too. It's staying again by selfishness. And we were just trying or be the hero 
or being famous there, there or being uh, admired by that person or, or get, get our, some scores settled and some of the, 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 the hate that we have grown up with. Uh, this is the opportunity to just get it back. So humans, we are very complex. So I cannot really judge what others do, but I can be vulnerable and tell you what I am uh, and what are my motives. And I have to acknowledge that many times that I have fought for justice, uh, uh, it has been stained by selfishness. And, and that process of being always uh, be held accountable to ourselves and to special friends that will hold us accountable. And we don't feel threatened because they will just tell in your face. And I'm glad that I have some of those friends. And if you don't have those uh, people who are uh, in YouTube or Facebook and so on, get somebody. And, and you get somebody like that when you open up. Uh, and then it, it, it's a development, it's a process. So, so I think that, that we should analyze uh, and deeply thought about our own concepts of justice. Mm. So we're talking about love and leadership in a loving way. And this raises the question in my mind, can we talk about boundaries? Like, is there ever a time that we should say no? Is boundaries biblical? Did Jesus set boundaries? If so, how, how do we do it practically? Could we, could we dive into that a little bit? Thank you for bringing it up, Zoe, because uh, I don't have an answer. <laughs> uh, many times we will think that there's a recipe that, where we can set up boundaries, and I wish uh, I will have that. Uh, but many times those just are blurred. Sometimes uh, some people get into our lives that, um, and, and this is for a period of time, that uh, we will just give them everything, you know, uh, care, time, money, attention. And, and perhaps that's what the Lord wanted for us during that time. Uh, a relative, a child. Um, so I can just tell you, we have to be in tune with God at every situation. There's no cookie cutter way of doing things. Uh, I have had safe boundaries. Uh, for example, <laughs> Adelina has, a, has a, a, an hourglass. And I, 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 am, I have this uh, idea of myself that I am very open. My office is open, doors open. Uh, my secretaries get upset with me because you know, uh, they see me really busy and they want to protect me. And when I hear that somebody's asking for me or they needed counseling or something, I would just, just let them in. And then they will come, Pastor, you're doing this, you know, you're supposed to finish this work and then you're going to stay late. I said, don't worry. But then after this pe person becomes a frequent flyer, then I will have my hourglass and I will put it there. I have two. I have a five minute and a 15 minute glass. So it depends on how much time I will give you. Uh, uh, and he used to do that until there was a lady who came and she saw what I was doing. <laughs> she was one of those frequent flyers. So she gave me, she said, Pastor, thank you for your time. I value a lot of your time. But I purchased you this two-hour hourglass. <laughs> you're smart. She was smart. But uh, I realized that <clears throat> even I, I like to, to, to claim that I am so open but then I have also boundaries and then I begin using my phone or I begin looking at my computer and, and then, and I'm selfish too. Uh, so again, I guess we have to monitor ourselves every day in every relationship. Mm. Is setting boundaries selfish? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think it's selfish. I don't think it's selfish. I think that uh, uh, the fact that we, we, sometimes set them up for some persons and then not to others, that can become self-serving. Uh, if somebody that it's important, I will make them space. And then somebody that I don't consider important, then I'm not giving them the same space. Then my boundaries are, 
And they are, you know, I see myself, I see my actions, perhaps other people are holier than me, you know, but uh, and, and I'm not holy at all, but uh, I see being hypocritical at some point, you know, I don't have time to do this now, but then this other peer person calls me, then I open up and there's time, all, all of a sudden there's time, or a project, you know, that I am, not, I am really stuck in other projects, and then I will allow other things to come up and, and interrupt that. So uh, we are very complex and I have a daily struggle on what I do, what I invest time and, and how I can really be consistent with uh, safe boundaries and this struggle with selfishness, if it is. Mm. Mm. I actually something? think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I actually think it's really interesting. Um, Benet Brown, Dr. Benet Brown, she actually did a study on boundaries and she found that the most compassionate people had the most boundaries. Mm. And I think that a lot of it is because when you give yourself the space to process things that are happening, you're able to have more empathy because when you when you understand why you're doing things like like as he said is like when you un when you look at yourself and say oh it's like let me like look at why this stuff is happening you're able to give others the benefit of the doubt it's like well i didn't understand what the hell was happening maybe they don't understand why they're doing this either and it's just by having boundaries you give yourself time and space and when others see your boundaries they're like oh, you'll probably be willing to give me the same time and space. And so they trust you and they respect you because like we think it's like you have to be open all the time or else everyone's going to think that you just shut off and you're a hermit. And it's like, no, people need time to process, to be alone, to be to reflect on the world. And when you set that time for yourself, Others will respect you for that, and they will respect the bound, and they will assume that you'll respect the same boundaries they have. Yeah, I am not a very good person because I don't have very good boundaries, and many times I will allow people to get into my life, into my house, into my wallet, you know, and 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 I am a mess, and and then I have to pull back, and I have this struggle, uh, and then I have four children that I want to be careful of them you know I have the work and I have uh, uh, Bible studies and people who are in need and, and and so many things and and saying no is not something that it's easy for me so I guess I'm not a very good person and and I read the book uh, on boundaries and, and the workbook too and 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 they were not you know at least I did not follow them through a lot but at least I try you know at least I try uh, last about two weeks ago we were in a university board. I, I belong to 10 university boards. So we have some meetings and I try to be in as many as possible. This, this one was, it began one o'clock and it was five o'clock and still they have like six points more in the agenda. So I, I pulled down my pants and I pulled some shorts and I went to the beach and from the beach, I did a, 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 a Facebook live and I tagged the president of the of the university and the union said, hey guys, I'm glad that you're having fun in your meeting, but right now I had had migraine for the last four days. I'm sorry, but I need this time. So I guess every now and then I try to put up my boundaries, especially for my family. For my family, those I try to be sacred uh, from my family. I was with my children in the beach, not by myself. <laughs> Wow. Within that, I really hear you saying that, you know, to, to set proper boundaries, both as a leader and, and just as, as anybody, right? Because I guess in our own way, we're all leaders to somebody or anyone really in our life. I hear you saying that we first have to really listen to ourselves, right? What are our needs? And we have to address those. Ashley, you mentioned reflecting on things that happen to us, or maybe our own thoughts, giving us that time and space to work through them. But something else that I also heard you say a little bit earlier, Efren, is that we have to listen to other people. And sometimes even if we're taking that time for self-reflection, we don't always catch when we're not taking care of ourselves. We're not setting those proper boundaries. Like you mentioned, 
a friend that, you know, your secretaries gave you those little hourglasses just to help you out, be able to set those proper boundaries with time. And I have to think that's like a really big part of leadership is learning to listen to ourselves and learning to listen to other people because they often see things that we don't yes. about ourselves. And, and let me tell you something. Uh, there's this mantra that says that leadership is a lonely place and leadership is the peak up there. And, and, and I did this by, by myself and so on. But no, that kind of leadership, that sucks, you know. Uh, true leadership is surrounded by people. If you go to Andrews and just check out my dissertation, I don't have one line or two lines giving thanks to this, this, and this. I had seven pages. It had to be cut to five because I had so many people that I am thankful. It's a community. And every time, everything that I have been able to, to do for God's honor and glory has been part of a community, a tribe. And, and I have my tribe is, is large. And, and a true leader or a, a vulnerable leader will, be, will have that tribe. It's not alone. The, 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 the leader who is there in that pedestal, yeah, it's a space that is really narrow. No wonder you're alone. But, but the one who's vulnerable, that is willing to, to, be, to listen to the others and so on, will be always in a crowd, in a tribe. Mm. That's awesome. Oh, go ahead again. I can, I can wait. Okay. So that's beautiful. That's, that is a fantastic. Your point of bringing up community and Adelina, like, I think that perfectly ties in with what you said earlier about Jesus really being a leader that we can sort of emulate, right? Because he, he didn't just have people, crowds that were around him listening to him, but he created a community of disciples, right? That he was, of course, training up, but really were there, like, they were all kind of growing together in a way. And within that, reading through the gospels and reading through how Jesus kind of showed himself to be the Messiah first to his disciples and then began training them. He started pulling back as a leader and really giving his disciples space to be able to go out and minister to the people almost in the word that's coming to my mind is like he empowered them almost. And within like the realm of leadership, how can we as leaders emulate that? kind of pulling away and empowering other people that maybe are around us or that are trying to do what we're doing? How can we empower them and kind of give up some of our power as leaders to, uh, to better implement that? Honestly, I enjoy so much to see other people succeed. I am tall. Mm -hmm. I am tall. I am uh, more than six, six feet, but I was really bad playing basketball. <laughs> People expected me to be the dunk guy and so on, but I was really bad. But I was good taking the ball and so on. And my greatest joy was to pass up the ball and see others just do what I was not able because my GPS is all over the place. And and the, one of the joys, the greatest joys of my life is to have been able to allow or to create the, the, the conditions for other people to succeed, either in their studies, providing uh, study opportunities, career opportunities. Uh, today, I was recommending people uh, for certain positions in, in, you know, in, in different universities. I, will, I cannot give the details, but I was speaking about them, how great they are and i hope they will get the job uh, there are two different scenarios and then uh, uh, to provide education uh, what i do we have 10 sites we have cuba venezuela haiti uh, costa rica mexico colombia and, and to provide education what i was uh, i had at andrews to be able to provide it to people from inter america and our seminary for god's glory we we have the ATS accreditation, the Association of Theological Schools. We have AAA accreditation. We were allowed now to provide a PhD program uh, in biblical studies that will be uh, unique uh, and will be 
free for those of Inter America. You know, they don't have to go to, to suffer cold weather and, and to get in student loans that I am still paying. And, and, and I love my experience at Andrews. Don't get me wrong, you know, that was home for me and my children were born there and I have so many memories, but most people will not be able to do it. So uh, the fact that we can provide for others and enjoy doing that, it's not the sense that, okay, I have arrived, let's close the door, let's be the gatekeeper because it was so difficult to get there. You cannot imagine how difficult it is to write a book and to do this and to provide a lecture. That's, that's not true, you know, it's not that difficult and, and uh, uh, enjoy doing that. And I think that that's part of uh, the, the true leadership as, as it should be, I guess. Awesome. Um, it's 7.55 uh, and it's hard to believe. Uh, we have touched on quite a few things that definitely are getting my, our minds uh, spinning here. But if I'm, I, have a, I have a question for you maybe to finalize this segment of our discussion before the takeaways, if you're willing to share, um, have you ever struggled personally with God is love? Um, and if yes, what was it like for you and how did you resolve that? If I can put it this way, we never quite resolve everything fully, but if that makes sense. Uh, when I began my ministry, uh, there was a child, a baby, that was preborn, and, uh, and and we were praying for her, and, and she was getting better. But uh, after a few months, uh, she died, and the uncle uh, was trying to give comfort to the father and spoke about what decisions, perhaps, Milagros would have taken. And the father began cursing, saying really nasty words. And I was enjoying what he was saying because I felt the same. All those blasphemous words were the ones that I wanted to say. I hate small coffins. Uh, and I have had to bury way too many of them. And every time that I bury a coffin like that, my faith, gets buried. Uh, when I was at Andrews, my wife was pregnant from the second child and Felix got his wife to Alma. And our two children were born almost a few weeks apart. Felix's child developed cancer. And we prayed and we were so certain. And when he died, I was so angry. I was so angry, and uh, and he never, never really. We don't get over that, I, as people say. We just live with it. Mm -hmm. About a month, three weeks ago, a month ago, my nephew. He was twenty years old, and he grew up basically with my children. My only nephew from my wife's side, and. And he died of an aneurysm, set of an aneurysm. And those wounds again opened, and my anger again uh, came up. And, uh, but I am not scared to, 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 to curse or to say or to express that as Asaf did in Psalm 73 of Habakkuk. When he was upset and he uh, lift his fist to God, and perhaps there are some people that can that have more faith and can be able to be leaders of his that can inspire in the midst of pain and suffering and and be stoic and being strong. But but I'm not, and I can't. I cannot pretend that, and I will not pretend that. And if people are willing to be ministered by such a foul-mouthed, angry, uh, weak, faded leader, then they're welcome to, to follow 
me as I follow Jesus. But uh, it's just a, it's a process. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, these are these are questions that everyone struggles with, uh, not once in life, but many times throughout life, because things keep happening. Uh, you feel like you resolve one issue, something else comes along. Um, and sometimes they come compounded. You know, this, there's a complexity of issues that you have to deal with. Um, I see love in anger. Uh, and I think if we, uh, I think in one episode, someone actually mentioned that, I don't remember right now who that, maybe Dr. Pekam, that um, God's anger is another face of his love. And so if we, cannot experience that, you know, gut-wrenching feeling of this is deeply wrong and pretend to be loving and think we're loving. I don't know how deep our love really gets uh, because when people suffer, you suffer with them and that's love. And, 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 and God gets angry at suffering of every one of his children. And so, um, Efrain, I really appreciate what you shared with us. I appreciate your person and uh, what you brought to this conversation. Um, vulnerability is not easy. We all know that. Um, but it's extremely valuable so that we can be real with each other. And that's a long process. It's a long process. It takes, I mean, some of us barely know each other, right? Um, it's a long process. Uh, it's how we form communities, as we talked uh, Tuesday with Dr. Hatfield is how we form communities, how we feel in community with other people when we can be real and honest. And um, that's the best path in my understanding for growth together into the likeness of God uh, as, as fragile and broken human beings. And so I really appreciate the discussion, uh, Ephraim, but also all the comments and questions from everyone else, of course. Um, and um, so let's take now a few minutes to share a takeaway on the topic of God is love, leadership, vulnerability. Uh, what is your what is your takeaway for tonight? So along the lines of what we have just been discussing, I really, really loved what Ashley said earlier during the night. She said, God does not condemn human emotion. And that's so comforting to me that God feels emotion himself that God has given us the ability to feel emotion and that he is, he is not condemning or judging me for feeling angry at pain or angry at injustice or sad about disappointments. And that was so beautiful and just opened my eyes up more to the type of love that God is. And along the lines of leadership takeaways, um, Pastor Efrain, I love what you said that we are creating a space for people to be successful. And that takes off the pressure off of me. It, it doesn't make me want to strive for perfection and just be the most successful or the best performer or the, the top in the world but it's, it's so much more fulfilling to strive to create an environment for other people to succeed, for other people to be the best, for other people to have joy. And I think that gives me a greater purpose and greater vision for what I'm wanting to do as a leader and with my career. Wow. I think for myself, the biggest thing was really talking about boundaries and how it's okay to set proper boundaries with people. Uh, a lot of time as leaders, we feel as though we have to continuously give and be there for other people and do this all, along the lines of servant leadership. And we should be but that doesn't mean that we can't take time to kind of repair ourselves, to reflect on how we're doing. And within that, 
listening to ourself. And maybe that's like a physical need of our body talking to us, or maybe a mental one, but also listening to others and letting them speak into our lives and being open to that. Because sometimes we, we don't see what we need and others do. And being creating communities where there are people around us to be able to do that, where we're maybe even more vulnerable with them than we are with other people is so important. And really as a leader, it's not just about you, but it's about the communities around you that build that you're building up to not necessarily help yourself, but really to all be able to help each other. I think that was the biggest thing for me. I think for me, it was probably leaders must first be followers of Christ because followership is going to impact your leadership more than you're pretending to be okay. It's like, I know for me, it's like there, I, I don't think that there are many good followers around me to support leaders that we have. It's like good followers create that community that you were talking about. They also see vulnerability and they share it back. They show the love of Christ and as leaders, we reflect it right back. And as we reflect the love of Christ, they reflect it right back. And all together as church members, as Christians, as leaders, as followers, we all continue shining the light of Christ so much so that if we were on a hill, no big bushel could, could stop our light from being shown. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I definitely appreciate the concept of vulnerability. Uh, it's something I've learned personally in my chaplaincy education and I cherish that. I find it very freeing and I find it very empowering um, and of myself and of the community around me when I, when I can be vulnerable. Um, also, if I very much appreciate the highlight of on honesty and on being real. And I think it's very easy for people when they become leaders in any capacity at any level um, to, to forget to, how can I say, to um, lead in such a way that if they're not intentional about creating a space of mutual accountability, they will become blind to themselves. Because people are not, people do not feel comfortable coming up to a leader and saying, hey, you know, this wasn't too good, or hey, you could improve here. They're not comfortable. And so you, I think it's our responsibility to ask for that to invite people to give us feedback, to invite the mutual accountability. And that will make us, uh, again, it's vulnerable, but that will ensure that we're not blind to ourselves. And everyone is, uh, everyone can become blind. It doesn't matter how educated you are or how smart you are. This is a matter of human nature. <laughs> and, and so living in isolation in that, in that um, space of leadership, I think is very damaging to you and to, to those around you. So I appreciate this, um, this, this concept of vulnerability, honesty, being real, mutual accountability. I think it serves everyone better. Um, and in some way it probably serves God best because he'll, it allows him to do more things with us than, than he would do otherwise. Um, Efrain, uh, I would I invite you to speak to our viewers now for a couple minutes. Um, what would you say to them about God, love and leadership? I, I'm not even sure why I'm here, because if I had succeeded in one of the areas of leadership, I will feel that I have something to teach, but uh, I have failed in all of the above, you know, the areas of uh, boundaries, in the areas of selfishness, in the areas of uh, keeping grudges or keeping scores uh, in theory of being angry uh, that uh, that uh, I, I just take it too personal when I was listening to Adelina's story about her about abuse you know I, for me I felt like a big 
uh, uh, something in my chest just crushing and it's the same with Ashley and the experiences of others I take it I take them very personal so I my only comfort is uh, to follow that beautiful book of Philippians and I will read it from the end to the beginning 413 I can do all things in Christ 313 I forget what is behind and I move forward remembering that I am not perfect but I am perfect 213 he is the one who does the will and the do and one six he who began the good work will be able to finish it so we are a working process let's join the journey and let the process of transformation go on in our lives thank you so much thank you so much Efrain. Um, on behalf of the group and also on behalf of our viewers we really appreciate your time first of all it's uh it's uh i know you're busy and so we appreciate that you were willing and able to spend this time with us um and we appreciate your words uh i think it's going to be it's given us some th things to ponder for sure uh for after the discussion uh but these you know the words that you shared tonight are not so much intellectual as uh, in the sense of um how can i say they go to the heart of the issue and so these are the kind of things we have to process more, like more holistically okay what does it mean for me to be real what does it mean for me to be honest now seriously <laughs> you know so um it's uh it's a holistic approach that i appreciate that you are inviting us into uh, thank you very much for that thank you zoe thank you keegan and thank you ashley um for our viewers and for for you guys uh this is episode 12 of season one god is love and we're officially finishing this season tonight um and so i wanted to just take a minute to thank everyone for spending the time with us whether you've been part of the live discussion part of the students group whether you've been a guest uh, an expert on this program thank you for your wisdom thank you for sharing us uh, from scripture from your expertise from your knowledge experience um, everything has been extremely valuable it's been a very rich experience and I'm guessing combined the more or less probably 14 hours altogether uh, really can offer us a picture a better picture not a full picture for sure but a better understanding of God as love and of the concept of love what does it look like how can we be more like that and so on and so forth um, and so it's uh, it's time to say goodbye for this season but I'm happy to introduce the next season to you uh, we will take a week break and then we will come back on March 23rd. We will continue our discussions with season two when we will talk about God's presence. Um, God's presence, March 23 to April 29, Tuesdays and Thursdays as usual. We'll raise all kinds of questions like what kind of presence is God? Um, how does he manifest his presence? Is he ever absent? Is he always present or is he ever absent? What do we do with his absence? How, how do we feel? How do we cope with that? Um, we'll talk about Moses, who experienced God's presence in a unique way. Very interesting case study. Uh, presence of three beings of the Trinity. Uh, we'll talk about Jesus' presence, the Sabbath as special presence, the sanctuary, of course, omnipresence. Uh, final reunion with God in the Revelation, when we will be present face to face. And, and so much more, really. Uh, so we have a nice, uh, great uh, lineup of guests um, who will join us on each one of these episodes. Um, and so I invite you to plan to be there with us. And um, I also need to take a minute to say a few words of thanks because this program, like Ephraim was sharing earlier, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's, it's been a quite a, a number of people. Uh, it's been quite a large group. So. Uh, just real quick, a uh, big word of thank you to my sister Larissa because this program was her vision. So I'm fulfilling her vision and I'm blessed to be able to participate in this capacity. The format uh, and, and part of the structure was her vision. A uh, big thank you to Sandro. Sandro, I know you can hear us. <laughs> and so <laughs> thank you so much every single time. Without failure, you've been here for 12 episodes helping us with a live stream. Invaluable. We really appreciate that. 
Um, a big thank you to Dr. John Reeve, ATS President, and Dr. Rahel Wells, ATS Vice President at the moment, for catching the vision and empowering us to, to do this. Um, thank you also to the ATS committee members who supported the project and who are funding it. Um, this obviously would not happen without you, so yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, a big thank you to April Yunker, um, the ATS accountant. She's been extremely helpful in communication and, and dealing with finances, and I really appreciate the quality of your work in communication, April, so thank you for that. Um, Nate Gibbs, your contribution to the planning stages, we appreciate it, it's been helpful. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Martin Hanna for conceptual guidance. He's my dissertation advisor, and he has really been helpful in helping with the structure and the conceptual aspect of, of um, the, the program altogether. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but if, if I happen to forget you and you've been involved in any way, uh, I might come back to it later in a personal note or something like that. But I, I do really appreciate, I'm aware that this could not have happened in a vacuum. And I'm thankful to see how God brought everyone together in different roles to make this happen. It's been a rich experience. We are all much richer because of these conversations. And it's not something that stops here. For us, it's something we take with us and we'll continue to ponder everything we learned and it will come back to us in different contexts. God will bring things back that we learn here in different contexts to emphasize that and to reinforce that in our thinking and in our practice. Um, so big thank you again to everyone, of course, to our viewers. If you've been part of the discussion uh, live, we appreciate your comments. If you've been watching, if you've been sharing and, and contributing to the growth of our program, we appreciate that. Please continue to do so. And um, so I'm saying goodbye for now for a week until I see you on March 23. Thank you. God bless you.